Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Cadden Saunders Beswick. Cadden, welcome to the show. It's amazing to be here. This is uh, this is like a dream come true to be on the show that I listen to a lot for research and so great. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, I really appreciate that. And we met uh, obviously through social media. You have worked on um, your master's thesis, which I'll, I'll say what it is and we'll talk about it a little bit more, is from double drumming to the double bass drums study of what being a drummer means, um, which is a really cool title. Uh, and we actually met because you asked me to kind of contribute a little bit, I guess, or ask you sent me some questions, which you did with a lot of people, um, which there's a lot there to talk about in general um, of how that all worked and putting that together. Yeah. So this is, this is a follow on of what I did for my undergraduate, um, which that all started in a, a weird process. When I went to uni, I wanted to be the next Hal Blaine and was basically told in week one, that doesn't exist anymore. You <laughs> that session level of being that kind of session drummer doesn't exist anymore. And you need a portfolio career. It's basically what we were told. So it spent like two years trying to work out what on earth I can do that I, I can teach because every single drummer can teach. It's almost like that's the go-to next thing down on that. And uh, I've always had this, um, a love of history. Um, when I was in college, I remember doing um, doing a, a thesis on um, the Holocaust denial and exploring that whole conspiracy and stuff. And I like looking mm. at that. Where did that all come from? Because it would have had to have come from after the Holocaust and stuff like that. So I've always had that like for history and stuff like that. And that's basically followed me through. And so when it came time to what can I do? What can I contribute? It became looking at the history of the drum kit. Um, so from double drumming to the double bass drummers, perhaps doesn't chronologically tell the history of the drum kit, perhaps you'd, as you'd expect. It doesn't start with, we're going to start here and work our way up. It's more of an exploration, I guess, of the how and the why those changes happened. So... Sure. Why did we end up with double drumming? Well, if you want to look at that from that perspective, you've got to go back to 1865, after the Civil War, when for cost purposes, they wanted um, one guy to do three jobs or one guy to do two people's jobs. So that became, he's going to put the bass drum down, he's going to have the snare drum, This that way, way that it worked. And they came up with the double drumming technique uh, then it was looking at, well, why did we get a bass pedal? It's more obvious when you look at it that it's not entirely practical to keep kicking a bass drum or playing mm -hmm. it with your hands in those aspects, something like that. So the bass pedal was born. And then it was kind of like, well, the left foot can do something, the right foot can do something. So there's the low boy. And it more explores the, well, why did we get up to this point? And then... Why in the 80s did we end up with these huge drum kits, massive drum kits? Why were yeah. concert toms a thing? And it more explores those, um, those elements more than perhaps it does the nuances of why do we have these tension or to this or die cast and metal hoops. Sure. It doesn't do that so much. There's a, a thesis on this, my, this side by my mentor, which is called the construction of performance on the early drum kit. That goes through the history of the drum kit, perhaps in a more nuanced bit by bit sense. Um, sure. And I think Theodore Dennis Brown, which was one of the first theses on the drum kit, that went through a lot of the playing techniques and looked at that. Whereas I wanted to combine those two things and look at them really um, following on from what I'd learned in my undergrad. That's, that's essentially the, the TLDR yeah. of it. What are some cool things or just facts or information that you um, learned about with that earliest double drumming type of playing? Is there anything that sticks out to you? That, that was a very, very difficult period to begin to talk about. And it cropped up in my first, uh, my undergrad, which was something I wanted to explore a little bit more. It was one of those little sound bites that was like, that needs to be followed up on. And it was a lot of people, when I asked them, where did the history of the drum kit start? Or could you explain the history of the drum kit rather? Um, they only really started at about 1920 with trap skits. That was where yeah. they'd start. This double drumming and stuff, when I'd mention that to some people, they'd be like, oh, double bass drums. I'm like, 
That's where the sure. title of this second one come from. So thinking people are going to see that and think, well, they're the same thing. Because there was a lot of people who were to me was like, oh, you mean double bass drums? I was like, no, do you mean, is this an area that's a bit lost? And you can't find anyone to interview about that anymore. Now it's all got to come from a secondary yeah. source because the people that were around really starting those techniques just aren't alive anymore. So that's the, I suppose the biggest takeaway from that, I suppose, is not so much a fact that people would um, be like, oh my God, that's new knowledge I didn't know. Uh, it's more so the fact that a lot of it could be lost. A lot of those nuances at the time could be lost. Whereas yeah. now when I talk to people about stuff, maybe from about 1980 onwards, I can get so much information. I can tell you how it, I've had people tell me how it feels to play Simmons drum pads, the first ones that come out and the, the cheeky little techniques they use then. You can't get those like now for the double drumming and you can only start to get some inklings of stuff, even from trap sets now. You're looking at basically from Beatlemania onwards as an area of which you can study, where you can sit down with someone and be like, why did you do that? Was this yeah. a thing that happened around your time? All right. So then how did you do that? And that's such a good point because, um, like you said, you're just relying on other people's uh, information. And it's not like this is a thing where it's like the most uh, written about topic in the world, obviously. I mean, it's it's a pretty specific thing where they're probably documenting more like world affairs and the war and things like that, as opposed to what one member of the band uh, is doing, where maybe someone didn't think to write it down. Um, but, but how did you then... Uh, with your, um, I'm sure, studious mind of like really in the in the trenches researching, how did you go about putting things together? You know, like what was your what was your process there? Photos. That's a that's a big thing. Uh, I know mm -hmm. that Daniel Glass and my mentor, and I think Matt Brennan, who we've had on this podcast before, who's going to be yeah. my mentor for my PhD. Um, he, uh, I know that Dave looked at rather. Um, photos before and used that a lot uh, i know um paul archibald who did the, the essay i referenced earlier um a lot of that was archive research for him so it's, it's been a lot of taking his work to build upon it and i want to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent there which will probably help explain a little bit more and when i was researching all of this which just includes both essays and will be going forward Behind me are the three academic essays. You've got Theodore Dennis Brown, um, Paul's, and uh, Bill Bruford's. Those are the three academic papers. Before that, and still to some degree now, it's only really starting to change recently, viewing the drum kit in an academic light and someone turning around and saying, I want to study the drum kit, what that means and what that is as an instrument, as its history, as the players, as the techniques and everything that goes into that. That's really recent. So the fields of stuff that I have to, available to me to collect information from, are literally the three behind me. Everything mm. else has to be unverified. It can even be someone's username, like drummer123 says that he's seen a picture five years ago at the back of a drummer magazine that showed someone with a bass pedal in 1899. I can't, I can't ever know if that's real. He could have just been yep. doing that for clout. This person could do this for clout to try and show oh, yeah. that. I can't know that for sure, but I've got to take that as it could have been a bass pedal then. That could yeah. have been that in some weird place down in the back of Mission Gun in someone's shed, he built a bass pedal. It yeah. could be in Leeds. It could be in France. It could be anywhere. That this was yeah. built but the first time we know for sure that the base pedal exists is with ludwig when it gets patented that's when we yeah. that's the date that we could go yes 1909 so, or yeah whatever and um man i have this and i'm gonna do a video series on it i have uh, a gentleman named jerry ryman raymond ryman has been sending me uh a binder and then he's been sending me supplemental pages of um drum advertisements through in the newspapers going back to like the early 1900s that he uses newspaper.com I believe but he has I mean I think I'm now at 100 pages that he sent me back and front with little articles on it 
Um, and I see things there. And I'm again, like I said, I want to do a video going through each one. Like, here's some really articles from the 1900s about drum heads. But that is all not <sighs> until now for me when he put it all in one place. Um, you, you, there's so many little fragmented pieces of history all over the place where, you know, it takes people like you or Jerry, who's sending this stuff to me to really put it all together. And, uh, and there's a lot of competing, um, information where maybe it doesn't line up and there's people who are adamant that they're right. And, um, but because they heard it or they saw something, but sometimes people's memories fail them or you really start to the forums are, uh, you know, a place to to look for information. But I'm sure like you, this is a very studious thing that you're doing where you have to verify it and prove it, uh, which can be hard. Like sometimes with these podcasts, we just like we can just talk. It's 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 for fun. It's for history. It's for knowledge, but it's for fun that you weren't doing this for fun. I mean, you were doing this for a um, degree. I mean, really? Yeah. D just to pick up on that point a little bit. Um, this was done partially for fun. I wanted something that I was going to find fun doing it. Because I knew if yeah. I had to sit there and write an essay on coordination that I don't think I would have made it out the other side still playing drums. I think that would have finished me. I know that there was points at university where I found it really difficult and struggled to see the point of learning some certain te things and techniques um because i was like i don't need that the way i want to go and the way i want to play i don't think i need that i would much rather learn these things and look at yeah. these things um so i knew that i wanted something that was going to be fun and something that would impact my playing and influence my playing i like to play with color that's the way i've desc always described it i i have a low boy pedal that dw still make um, mm -hmm. but i don't use it for symbols i use it to put the stuff you'd usually stack on top of a hi-hat. So I've got a shaker, a tambourine, uh, another tambourine, and I create a, a foot sound source, a bit like stuff oh. that um, Thomas Lang does, I guess, in a way, with using yeah. different foot things to create different sounds. So it doesn't necessarily mean I can play polyrhythms with each hand because that's just not the way I play. But I can hit, I can do a basic rhythm with this and a basic rhythm with this hand, but they can all hit different color sounds and in different patterns. That's how I've always liked to play. So I knew that this was going to influence my playing more, learning these older things and older techniques that I can bring back, especially something like the low boy. And that's just like the one of the go-to things for me. So I've always been like, why did it disappear? I would love to use that. So I've just ended up bringing that back in my playing, whether or not that would ever become a thing that all drummers do, probably not. So, all right, then talking about your, uh, you know, your research and all this stuff, which I have up over here, you have a lot of people that you talk to. You interviewed a lot of people. Let's maybe go down that road of like, you know, how do you compile all this information? Why don't you maybe list off some of the people who are who who you did interview and uh, and were included in this that you that you put together and then uh, maybe a little bit about how that process worked and what you found from talking to some of these people about their level of knowledge on history and all that stuff. But starting off, who, who, who was a contributor to this, this process? Uh, uh, Thomas Lang did something. Steve White has done something. Uh, I got to meet uh, one of my biggest drumming influences, Chris Freya from the Zach Brown band, Don Famolaro. <laughs> is, yeah. Um, just really chancing my arm and thinking, who are some of the biggest drummers that I know? In addition to all the local people that I know, I probably did 15, 20 local people that hmm. I, people wouldn't necessarily know because they're not household drumming names, but they're working in the industry and stuff like that. And some peers, some people my age. Um, my masters, I really pushed because I was absolutely gutted that I couldn't get any female drummers for my undergrad. And that was not for a want to try in. I tried really hard, but I just couldn't get anywhere with anyone. And with the one or two that I did manage to line up, um, one is now my girlfriend, ironically. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> so I can forgive her for not taking part, but just no yeah. nothing, nothing would line up with anyone. Yeah. So this time around, I really pushed hard on Instagram drummers, some of the female Instagram drummers, because that was the most sure. easy way to get hold of some people on there. Um, but that was really cool to get to talk to those people. But it was mostly with these like household names, just 
chance in my arm sending a, a message on Facebook, Instagram, even if I could find like agents, emails, websites, sure. and just saying that this interview can be done um, via paper. I can email it you basically, or if you're willing to, you can come and do um, a Zoom like this. Like, I think I was obviously quite lucky that I was doing this during like the second, yeah. third wave of a pandemic. So people tended to be at home doing nothing especially musicians. I was quite lucky that ironically lucky in a way that that kind of fell that way. So a lot, it was a, a mix really just depending on what their schedules were and whether or not they were willing to do it. But yeah, it was a dream and really helped a lot of my confidence in my playing and self-confidence for one to be able to turn around and go, yeah, I can email and talk to these people. I can hold my own in a conversation with them, which is yeah. baffling to oh. me. Totally. I mean, and, and a lot of the people who uh, you meet, I think it's interesting how a lot of the huge, um, you know, stars of drumming love. It's not. Of, of course, they love the instrument and they love the history of it where um, they're just like us, where you want it. They want to talk about it. And uh, and and especially guys like Daniel Glass and Matt Brennan. I mean, these are like history buffs and they, they are a as obsessed with it as we are. Um, and they're very, a lot of people I've found are very, um, which got, this comes up all the time, but they're very helpful and they want to help people and they want to share the knowledge, um, which it, it, people find out good things like that. Like, you know, oh, it's of course us saying, oh, these are great guys really does spread positive, you know, uh, vibes about them. And, and that's what it's all about, you know, being nice to other drummers. It really has come to to me realizing that I think a lot of drummers are really in like a cult of curiosity about other drummers and about dr the drum kit and about the history of the drum kit. I've ended up doing interviews where it's gone off on one a little bit because we've been like, oh, why do you use Sabian cymbals? Why do I use pasty cymbals? And we just sat there comparing for like 20 minutes going on about like, why did you pick this drum kit? And I was asking out of originally the question is like why did you pick that drum kit so like, was that because you saw like do you play uh, ludwig because of ringo like is, is that why or is it because you sat down one day at these drum kit and that's just how it happened but i find that yeah. it ends up being a cult of curiosity like why do i play premier drums uh i've got a 60s kit on that side and a 70s kit on that side and it's like why do i play them where it's just that's that's just how it fell for me. I just yeah. my drum teacher played Premier. I just got really used to the sound. Just like I can buy a drum kit, and then it came out by another drum kit, and I'll buy another drum kit, and it's just become. Well, I want to keep it the same brand because I quite like the sound of the one kit. The second yeah. kit was good, so why change once you've got two kits that sound good? But yeah, it there is a real like cult of curiosity, and a lot of people when I finished those interviews were like. I really want a copy of this, not because it's like, I want to see what you wrote about me. Like, make yeah. sure you haven't done something bad. It's kind of like, <laughs> I want to see what other people have said. I want to see where my words fit with other people. Was I the outlier? Did I say something that fit with everyone? Did you quote my words on this bit? Or do these, someone else's words really resonate with me? Like this quote just makes so much sense and explains what I was saying so much better. And I think yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of cult of curiosity about it. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And and y you had a good, it's just a good thought starter that you just said about, you know, someone who's playing Ludwig. Are you playing Ludwig because because you like Ringo or because you like uh, the sound of them? And there's nothing wrong with either, either one of them. I would say as a kid, I would absolutely be guilty of seeing a video of John Bonham playing and seeing the Ludwig logo and saying, oh, I want a Ludwig drum set without really knowing the sound of them. Um, so that's, that's that the importance of, of, of branding and putting a logo on things. And for premier, I mean, being a UK drummer, it's like, it's premier. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that's probably subliminally that kind of has to be in the back of your mind a little bit too, of like, we really get connected to our brands, you know? And I, I just tie this back wonderfully to my research. This was something that I wanted to look into these brands wise. And it was a little bit towards the um, how self-sufficient some brands were back in the late 40s, 50s, even into yeah. the 60s. Premier had Everplay. I'm just going to use Premier because this, this is the brand that I know the most about because I play them. I usually tie everything back to, to 
Premiere. They had their own um, hardware. They made their own sticks. Um, they made their own drum heads. They made their own drum kits, and they were tied in quite closely with Zin cymbals. So if you played Premiere, you had Premiere hardware. You had the Premiere made drum heads. You had the drumsticks by Premiere, and you had the cymbals by Premiere. So you were very self-sufficient. This one company was everything. And I think it was the Drumheads episode, the Ludwig Drumheads episode, that um, recently and a point stuck out that I was up here doing some like restorations and some kits. I had to stop because I was like, a jaw-dropping moment, it never occurred to me before, but I can't remember if it was you or who you were interviewing said that um, perhaps as the companies were getting bought out, they would look at certain areas and they would, that's not cost-effective, we don't need to do that anymore. Sure. And that happened in a way with Premier that it didn't become cost effective to make the heads. But not to worry, Remo and Evans are around so they can get their own heads. That's fine. They yeah. don't really need to make their own hardware because other companies exist. You've got Gibraltar, you've got DW, Yamaha, they'll be their own hardware. Yeah. That's fine. Don't need to worry about that. Sticks, you've got Promark, Beta. I've got Agna drum sticks. You, you've got a multitude of companies. And all of a sudden, the company goes from makes everything you can have to smaller and smaller and just a drum kit company. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was Bill Ryder on that episode who did a ton of research. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're, you're right. And then is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it, is it focusing more on one thing, which I can say seems like a good thing. Like, all right, we're, we're going to, uh, instead of being so spread out where, uh, you know, or do, is it better to focus on making what you're good at, which even now it's almost like things thin out even more where for a company to make their own shells is pretty impressive where now there's a company who makes their shells and maybe this is assembled it X factory and uh, everything else is kind of sent in where the days of everyone making everything seems go like far gone and, you know, just kind of, again, just as a, a thought, like if a company did say we make everything, we make the drum heads, we make everything in 2022, I think sometimes the thought might be why, like you don't need to. And God, making drum heads, especially back then, it's all that. I love the stories of sourcing calf skin and how competitive it was and not getting the, you know, the, the calf skin that had like holes in it and stuff. It was uh, it was just a different time. And I guess globalization wasn't as big where you couldn't get things from overseas or from, you know, uh, a different continent. You had to be more resourceful. Um, and was, I'm sure that came up in your research of just being like you said, you, you just you didn't have an option. Did the people you interview really uh, speak to that much or was that more of something you kind of just discovered on your own? It's more of a discovery on my own and and kind of a realization of you could pick any like drummer now, like just name a random drummer for like any instance. And it would be, oh, this is their drum kit company. Uh, this is their hardware company. This is their drumstick company. This is their cymbal company. I was yeah. hardly talking to anyone. And because of the amount of reach that perhaps DW has now, like they, they've got, I think, Gretsch, Gibraltar, Slingland, they're all under that umbrella. You could almost say in a, in some instance that that is probably the closest you can get to one company does it all. Yeah, it, true. But it isn't really because you're still playing a Gratch drum kit and maybe Gibraltar and DW hardware or like the amount of people you see with the, like a Gibraltar rack or the DW kit. It's like you would instantly think they're no different to any other um, drummer with a hardware and a drum kit company but they are kind of under the same umbrella but that more so i guess comes from the the ease of being able to get hold of that stuff quickly whether you're in brazil japan uk america canada you'll always be able to get hold of something from dw zildjian pasty yeah. remo all of those companies are pretty much there now so i guess that kind of defeats the object of making it all in one house because then the responsibility is if your artist, if your premier, and you make it in the UK, and your artist is playing Buenos Aires, and you make all your stuff in the UK, and they break their drum head in the middle of the tour, and it's like tomorrow they're playing in Brazil, that's a long way to get something. Yeah, and there's something to be said about endorsements, and 
you know, it's kind of cool for people to have five different endorsements with different, you know, this is my sticks and you have all these choices where we nowadays have a, um, a lot of choices. Whereas back in the day, you wouldn't have as much options. You kind of get your drum set and you'd put it together and going way back to the double drumming. It's like you're using an old marching bass drum and an old marching snare. And maybe there wasn't a snare stand until Leedy, I believe, or Wahlberg and Auger invented it. I forget which one. Um, but you had to make do. So there's there's like a, a ton of choice nowadays as opposed to back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Again, I suppose this is a naivety that perhaps you don't get until you get to some point. But in my mind, endorsement has always been an endorsement. I, I, to be honest, didn't really know what it meant. I've always dreamed of having an endorsement. I'd love <laughs> Pasty to come and endorse me. So this is me actively saying, come and endorse me, Pasty. This is, yeah. this is, this is my announcement that I love you. But <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought, oh, it, it is what it is. An endorsement's an endorsement. I never realized there was levels to an endorsement until I was interviewing someone and they were like, oh, this is what my endorsement, I won't say who it was or what level of like the endorsement they got or what company it is, but they explained to me how their endorsement worked. And I was like, hey, what? It's like, that's, yeah. that's crazy that you're at this level and you wouldn't be even touching someone at this level. But also, I can't even touch the level you're on. <laughs> so <laughs> I've still got to go and go. I've got to hope the shop that I go to has it, whereas this person can phone up their representative and request that symbol and get to that symbol. And it, it was interesting to get that um side of things and the, again there's so much that i would love to look into more like the history of hardware uh drum heads is something i've hardly not touched upon yet and uh history of endorsements um are just three things that i think once i've got like these trilogies of the history of drum kit finished that i think deserve research of their own there's a lot of areas that I would love to go back and be like, this needs to, this needs to, this needs looking at, because there's no one really yeah. doing it at the minute. Um, this is a very yeah. small field. It is. And I know um, there's an episode with Rob Cook on the history of drum endorsements. And then there's one uh, with John De Christopher about it was like how the drum industry works, which ended up being very like uh, kind of specific to like Zildjian, which he, he was, he talked about endorsements there. And um, I mean, you're, you're, the people who are on top, who are making a lot of money and getting the views, get the most attention, obviously. Um, but that whole thing of just like, it, it's interesting going back. I was looking through um, uh, the Gene Krupa book that Brooks Tegler, uh, he sent me the hard copy recently, which is awesome. But uh, just the the whole thing, all of this, all of the history stuff is like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, where you you look at it and, you know, they realized that, Gene was on, um, you know, a movie or a TV show and they're like, okay, next to the singer's head is the drum set. Why don't we have the Slingerland logo right there? And it was like, you know, well, duh, you think now all of this is just like, it's such a, 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 it's cool to look at the progression of this happened, then this happened, then this happened, but it definitely opens up to a lot of debate on who was more correct with, especially like, like the history of the hi-hat is a big one. Did someone, did Papa Joe Jones have a plumber friend who made it out of tubing? Did someone drop their stick and it hit the low boy and it made a sound on the, on, and they went, oh, I could play that with my stick. How would you in your thesis navigate those waters of what's, uh, we'll say truest, <laughs> where there's a lot of stories. How did you really say, I think this is the, the one that I'm going to document. Uh, this, I will use the hi hat one that you're talking about there. Now, I interviewed three people. They gave me three very, very different stories to what the hi hat was invented, uh, and I documented all three because, yeah. it's as I said to you before, how do I know that there wasn't a pedal in 1899? How none of us will know that, really. Nobody would really know. So the one story is that um, someone was working in a pit. In, I'll just tell you the three stories. and then the Please do, yeah. <laughs> so they saw that there was railings at the top. So they basically broke one of the railings off, took it back, took the, a spare bass drum pedal they made, really MacGyvered together, like 
Mythbusters-esque made this little tiny little foot thing that would basically make a clapping sound like that's what that's what they did uh, and that is how the hi-hat was invented that he eventually thought well i'll just make the two bigger so i can play it with my hand so i can also do the same that but i can also play it that was the one story i've heard for how the hi-hat was invented was some bloke thought that the pipe should be taller once he'd made a small one that could, it sounds plausible enough yeah there's the one i've heard where uh, someone was given a low boy that someone had basically built or whatever their approximation of a low boy was and that they were bending down to play it and they eventually thought it's got to be an easy way of doing this so I went back to the guy and said could you make it a bit taller so I don't have to lean down and play this with my wrong hat and then hi-hat was invented or the yeah. other one that I've heard that I possibly think is a little bit more um, true was that they were both invented at the same time. There was a, a low boy and a high hat. They were both the same thing. How they were invented, who they were invented by, nobody really knows, but they do appear in catalogues, especially premier catalogues together. I think in one of, I think it's my undergrad, I went through, this took me so long, it was so boring, but I went through every single premier catalog I could find, spent hours downloading every single one that I could find starting in like 1900 going all the way up to about 1970 i went through and had a look where did the low boy start here right write that down where did the low boy end here write that down and then went back through and looked where the hi-hat started and then wrote down where that was and then even looking for it just written in words like coming soon even so when was even the most inkling of it yeah and they do overlap quite a lot you could still buy and people i've always heard of well nobody bought a low boy when the high hat was invented low boy died like overnight like that it was gone i'm like it can't be if it was in the catalogs for like six years someone must yeah. have been buying it they don't waste space with with a th something that's going to be mm. no one's buying you yeah know? and they wouldn't race waste resources building something equally that nobody's using so yeah. someone must have been using it Someone must have been using both of them at the same time, or at least was using one of them. Yeah, and I know uh, Rob Cook talked about Skip Rutherford inventing the hi-hat and got a bunch of documentation. And uh, I remember when he talked about that, I was like, uh, now I know. But I was like, who's Skip Rutherford? <laughs> like, where did this come from? Which there's a lot of play. And then, but but what you also have to think, too, is like there's the, the world is huge. And like you're saying, it might have happened in different places at different times. And like, like sometimes, and I say this as an American, but sometimes the history of the drum kit, it gets kind of Americanized, even on my show as an American guy, which I'm sure you're aware of, but there are lots of other places where things happened. And I try to be cognizant of that and, and make sure there's more of a global, like not everything was invented here. What's your thoughts on, on that? The Americanization verse of stuff versus other things happening globally. This, this could be a podcast of its own to talk <laughs> about th this, this topic um so i do it myself i describe the drum kit as an american instrument and i think it is and i think it is to a different degree that to be fair all of these essays describe the drum kit as an american instrument for a very slightly different reason and i think that's because um america has always been a melting pot for lots of different cultures and different people and lots of stuff has come into america over the years the rogers was an irish company Zildjian mm -hmm. was Turkish. Those countries are European. The bass drum, the snare drum is European. The cymbals, you could argue, are Turkish, Greco, Egyptian, depends what. Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. Where you want to put that from. Tom Toms, you could argue, were really Chinese, but <laughs> what we've got now is nothing like a Chinese Tom Tom. Nothing no. like it. So, therefore, all of those things that came in have been Americanized, to put it in a way. And have become this instrument so but then again i've also heard that the drums home and if you follow the drum the drum now we're talking instead of a drum kit all the way back to its origins is african but when i look at a drum kit i can't see any african instruments on that there's no african drums have ever got into that a lot of african rhythms did there's the bambula i think beat which is talked about in um dennis brown's essay but yeah. in there, it does talk about B 
beats and where they came from. And it's more a, a history of drumming styles. So the drum kit is very all around the world. And another person that took part in my essay was Stanton Moore, uh, another big influence on mine. And the reason I really wanted to interview him um, was because he uses a Pandero, which is a South American drum. In, it's not something I've really looked into. I have got the podcast that uh, one of your podcasts on it that I need to get listening to, but it's working my way through so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there is 150 episodes, and I'm slowly, episodes. slowly catching through all more. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot to be still looked at in regards to that is why yeah. did we end up with the instrumentation we've ended up with? Where do all of these bits of instrumentation come from? And then I hear people describe it as an American instrument. And I'm like, but I think you've missed the point of why it's an American instrument. That's a good point. And because American instrument 2022 is different than American instrument early 1900s, where Stanton Moore talked about it with with uh, and, and Jazz Sawyer uh, on his episode, The History of the Drum Set, where we're talking New Orleans, we're talking Congo Square, we're talking uh, the very dark history of America and how people would end up here, but they would bring their African culture and and that's where, yeah, it does have a history with with Africa, even if it's not African drums per se set up in but but that concept of of a drum set is like multiple drums put together is kind of the makeup of a drum set. And I'm sure they were doing that uh, in African cultures going way back. But uh, that melting pot is just a, it's it's just so different. You need to think about it as, yes, American, but America was very different then, which now there's tons of immigrants and people coming and bringing their ideas. But then it was um, a little bit more different, where I guess you could say American, but but the actual inventors and uh, innovators were likely not born in America. Yeah, I, I think that's the point that I was trying to get to. And I really only briefly touch upon it in either essays that, that I think I put in the parts about the forced immigration, migration, and immigration was a, a very small paragraph for a very large topic. But mm -hmm. there was a lot to unpack in there of where all of these people come from and where little bits of the drum kit come from. I've got the Vic Firth um, rudiments poster up on the wall there. A lot of rudiments came from Swiss drumming to mm -hmm. really boil something down to a very short amount oh, of yeah. time. I've got on there then uh, next to it is um, Tommy Igo's uh, Groove Essentials. And there's a big list of world beats that, really go anything from like this Caribbean, Jamaican, Brazilian, this Dominican Republic, Afro-Cuban. There's a lot of stuff in there that was not meant to be played on a drum kit, but we've yeah. had to make it work on a drum kit that was played with vastly different instruments, like the cross stick covers usually for um, clave, stuff mm -hmm. like that. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there that... Um, really is a substitute for this sound to try and make it work on a drum kit, uh, which also leads to people being creative with those sounds. I've got old fashioned temple blocks that treat to my side that I think I just accidentally hit one with my ring. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. those there, you see them in Carl Palmer's kit in uh, Fan Trade for Common Man. Uh, that breeds creativity. They were originally Korean temple blocks that were used in I believe like temple settings don't really know that much about it. So when he researched how they got where they came from to get onto the drum kit and then where sure. they've ended up going from there so far, but they were, they're not being used for their intended purpose. When you're, no. when Carl Palmer's playing out and he turns and uses them, he's not using them for any temple moment. They're no, being used for their sound. <laughs> <laughs> so they've led to this, um, forced of being creative by what would have then been Americans because they will have immigrated and they would probably class themselves as American at that point. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, it is American, but it's because of all those different elements. And I think it's really cool that people can take these different ingredients and put it and make something new with it. And it's all very creative. And it's a really cool thing that I think uh, everyone, um, you know, and hopefully I think 
like we're doing, we can kind of dissect those pieces that make it up a little bit more and make it clearer of who was whose involvement did what uh, to a degree. But um, so as we're getting closer to kind of, you know, the, the time here, I want to um, just out of the title, double drumming to double bass drums. Let's talk a little bit about more about modern big double bass drum set because it's in the it's in the title. So what was your discoveries with that? Because I I, I do plan on doing a full on double bass set, uh, you know, um, episode Louis Belson, uh, Rufus Speedy Jones, I believe. And uh, and those guys. But um, what did you kind of learn as you went towards the, the end of it to double bass drumming? And I know it's just kind of the title to show the the evolution of it. But yeah, what'd you what'd you learn yeah. towards the end? The bit that I really feel most comfortable probably talking about, like where I know most of my stuff is going from about the uh, about the eighties, late seventies when electronics turned up, um, and I've got a few like anecdotal stories that I can pass off about how the state of drumming was at that time. So the first sure. one that I I love to love to talk about is that a drummer I know from around here. They used to play in uh, some of the labour clubs uh, back in the day. Um, which was like a big thing. I don't know if you'd know that much. I don't know if that translates well to America, but they were basically like clubs where a lot of workmen would go. Um, this was in the 50s, 60s, maybe even up to the 70s, um, where they put acts on, acts would come round and they would play, and they'd usually be a house band. And sometimes acts from America would come in and they would play some of their stuff, and they would also bring their own kits and stuff. So this is where this drummer I was talking to first saw his like Ludwig kits and his Gretsch kits and this is where you see in like the American kits coming over and how much better he described them were than they were the, the British kits. His kit um, had some of the very first premier electronics um, that were eventually became part of the Simmons line eventually in the history of it um, but they were essentially just a box with some like what looked like bongos essentially bongos in a box that's if you want to visualize what these looked like and this American guy came over with this brand spanking new invention called Roto Toms. And while they were on the tour, he was like, do you want to swap? So he swapped his very early electrics for Roto Toms. And now afterwards, looking back, he's like, that was probably the stupidest decision I ever made. Because those <laughs> would probably be very useful to me now. Roto Toms are great. I love Roto Toms, but everyone needs to own some Roto Toms at one point in their life. But yeah, probably should have kept the rare uh, early electronics. <laughs> but I suppose at the time, the electronics, they were a thing, but nobody really yeah. thought what was going to happen by the time the 80s come on and just like sure. that madness had appeared. Everything was electronic. Whereas yeah. the rotor toms were probably like alien technology, seeing them come over. It's something that wasn't available in the UK at the time. Like to jump at the chance to have that and add that to your kit, like you'd stand out. You'd be like, yeah, you know so and so. He's the one with the the rotor toms. Yeah, whereas, he's the do 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 guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then I suppose the other anecdote that I that I like from that time was that uh, someone was describing said uh, in the early eighties got to record with a Simmons pad, got to a studio, and um, the studio had said, "Don't worry, there's a drum kit." So he was like, "I won't bring any of my gear. I'll just bring my cymbals and sticks." Happy days, perfect. Got there and it was a Simmons pad. Uh, well, full Simmons kit then. So this studio got hold of a Simmons kit, really early Simmons kit. And I was like, mm. I was like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I've got to ask, what was it like to play? And it's like it was like hitting concrete. <laughs> he said they yeah. were terrible. The first mm. ones he said were terrible, and I just didn't get on with it. And he said I was really struggling to play it. He said, what well, one trick that I did notice that you could do with it, which I perhaps take for granted now. And that's something that I love to do um, with any electronics that I've got is um, you could unplug the floor tom sound and unplug the snare drum sound or the bass drum sound and swap over the leads. So mm. if you wanted to play the snare drum with your foot, you could. If you wanted to play the bass yeah. drum with your hand, you could. And he said, we had this, this, this song and it had insanely fast double bass drums. He said, I just couldn't get on with doing it with the, the Simmons pad. He said, you've got to remember back in those days, double pedals weren't really a thing or that he at least he hadn't come across them at that point so sure. he said his uh, his solution to not being able to play this quick enough and well enough on the simmons kit was to plug the bass drum into the floor tom and play it with his hands oh man <laughs> so, that's pretty uh, smart <laughs> yeah i was just sat there thinking 
yeah, that must have just been groundbreaking and just that must have been a real MacGyver moment during the time. Like, yeah. especially considering you've not really had experience with these electronics yet. So I suppose that the main thing I got to take away from there was that it was all really raw and just really brand spanking new in that probably 1977 to about 1984 period. Drummers were just getting to grips with this new world that just appeared and was getting exponentially bigger and looked like it was never going to stop. And it was all the drummers are going to be replaced thing, oh, yeah. which was a theme that I really wanted to hook on to looking forward. And um, I came away with some conclusions from that of that drummers will never be replaced because what happened with that was, um, and Taylor Hawkins really, once he'd passed away, a lot of obviously videos cropped up of interviews with him. So just watching him back, just, just remembering him and just, just remembering oh, yeah. how good of a player he was and, and stuff like that. But something, again, just piqued my interest when he was talking that he always used to listen to uh, like Queen records or 80s stuff. And then when he'd go and practice, he'd be trying to recreate these electronic drum sounds with his drum kit. So there was also a whole generation of drummers that were listening to this stuff with electronics that weren't necessarily playing at the time. So happening same time like tangentially just there's your drummers playing at this level gigging getting to grips mm -hmm. with this stuff there was also this new generation of drummers being influenced trying to recreate all of this electronics that by yeah. the time you get to the 90s and the 2000s have absorbed all of this technology and embraced all of this technology into their setups i think that's partially why we've ended up with an industry standard of an SPDSX. Yeah. And one of the mm -hmm. biggest takeaways from my master's uh, thesis that um, really stuck with me was that I did an interview with um, Mike Dolbey. Um, we just got talking about the, the music industry and stuff like that. And he said, um, the emphasis is now gone from drummers being a good drummer to get the gig, like Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, all of these were good drummers, probably great, massive drummers yeah. that could play anything you asked them, they'd play it. Yeah. The emphasis has now gone from you being this good, great drummer with this, uh, that can play anything and do anything to a drummer that now could be, eh, he's okay, but he can play in time. But the biggest added bonus is he knows how to work in SPDSX. Yeah. He can do the tracks. He can do this. Like, yeah. It's like, oh. So sometimes when you're going for a band now, it's perhaps not as much you need to be able to show off that you can play all of this amazing stuff. But maybe the fact that you know how to get a backing track up and that you know yeah. how to play to a click track. And it's like, that just blew my mind. And he was like, that's probably where the industry will go is yeah. that it will be more so emphasis on can you play in time? Have you got a good pocket? Have you got a good groove? While also, do you know where to put these drum pads to be able to play them and how to use them? And perhaps COVID has given um, this area of the drums the kick up the backside it needed, was like his yeah. words, was that yeah, he yeah. was telling me that there was a lot of really massive working drummers that used to turn up to a show and it'd be sound engineer, mic it up. I'm going to go and have a, a cigarette, a drink, I'm going to go and get a bite to eat. So we've never really dealt with any of this recording software side of stuff that yeah. as soon as COVID appeared, we're like, I don't know what to do. This is like, and they had to learn all of that. And that made me feel a lot better because I'd also been quite guilty of and ever just turning up and going, yeah, that's that's them over there's problem. So I, yeah, I'll yeah, wave yeah. at you, say hello to you, be polite to you, but I don't know what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in the last yeah. two years, I've had to learn how to do that. I've had to get drum mics. I got a Zoom R16 box. I've had to learn how to record. Mm -hmm. One of my uni exams went from, it was called ensemble performance, went from learning to play originals in a band setting and putting on a good performance and showing off your ability to play to good luck, you need to record this from home and submit it by six weeks. So, yeah. So, and uh, have it sound good and make it 
But we live in a great time now where, and I used to have that same Zoom R16, uh, really good little box. And it like, or I guess you could say mixer and, and, and interface. Um, the technology's gotten so much more accessible where those early electric drums back in the 80s are really expensive. And they're really kind of, it seems like they're pretty uncomfortable to play, but now it's so much easier. But uh, it's it's fortunate that we live in an era where there were, you know, where there's, I feel like, and I'm sure you do too, kind of a digital native where you grow up in this world, but people who are a little bit older might not, and it might be kind of scary to get into it or to get be lose out on a gig because you don't have that experience. But um, it just, it made me think too, that like, you know, you hear stories about like, well, um, I got the gig because I had a van, <laughs> like, and then we could take it to the gig and your drumming is important, but it's, it's also, it's like, you're a good drummer and you know, whatever the and is, you have electronics, you have this, you have a van, you uh, you have a basement where they can practice, you know, and now it's it's the importance of and those are all like kind of like, you know, I'm sort of joking, but really now it's like you you have to have that knowledge of pads, which I personally I've played them, but I don't have one. And I've, I'm sure I could figure it out pretty quick from kind of being with this world of, of electronics. But um you know, it's different, man. I mean, you just you kind of think it'd be nice just to be a drummer um, and not do this. But I think you should people should embrace it as, oh, it's another thing that I can do to differentiate myself and make myself more. Uh, uh, you got to be s sellable. You need to be, you know, um, stick out a little bit and um, and be comfortable with it. And and I, I have that where sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to do. I don't know. I, I do a lot of the social media stuff and I'm always like, I'm not doing TikTok. And then I'm like, I which I still don't. But I'm like, maybe I should <laughs> like. But you get in your mind stuck with like, I'm not going to do electronics. And then it's like, well, maybe I should like, why not? Um, but you just can't do something that makes you uncomfortable. But you also can't be uh, too rigid and not adapt to what's happening nowadays because it's it's a different world than it was in 1909 or 1865 obviously but if things are very 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 different like every decade things get extremely different you know yeah if, if i can just pick up on a couple of points you said in there and number one is not to say the fact that um being good at drums isn't important anymore but sure. that role of before 90 percent of it was how good you are then maybe it became 60 percent and now maybe it's 50% your ability to play the drums really well and have these desirable qualities. And the other 50% is knowing how to do some of this technological based stuff. Um, and then the other point that attaches to that and also came up during my master's was the amount of online resources out there now and knowing which ones are trustworthy and which ones are teaching you the right things. Um, and this was something that again, cropped up a lot. Um, I interviewed uh, Adam Coombs, who was from my university. I always like to, whenever I do any of the research, have a non-drummer take part or someone non-connected to the drum industry as almost like a control, like someone I can ask these questions to, to get something to compare what a non-drummer is to it. Um, and so I, my undergrad was a guitarist named Dan Patlansky from South Africa. This time around it was Adam Coombs. Um, and it, and I think it was him and Mike Dolby that we got into the biggest conversations about um, the fact that all of this resources online is great, but also not great <laughs> mm -hmm. because you might yeah. be learning the wrong thing. You're learning the wrong technique. You're sat the wrong way. Someone's taught you how to tune the drum. Not wrong because I don't think there's a wrong way to tune your drums, but has taught you a uh, weird yeah. way to do it. Yes. And yes. That might work for you because that might end up being your thing is that you've got Charlie Watts' broken eights. Nobody would teach you that. Uh, yeah, Ringo's, but, 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 yeah. Yeah, Ringo's really weird and sometimes quite garish Phil style. <laughs> the, when you hear that, you're like, oh, I know who that is. Yeah. Or as soon as you see the drummer, or if, if you went to any drummer, who's this? And did that, they'd be like, oh, Charlie Watts. Exactly. I know who that is. Or, um, like certain people like um, Copeland's really pushy style or ACDC songs really laid back style. Mm -hmm. Those things are not necessarily what you would be taught. Or if you did pick them up, you might fall into, 
you have quite a odd fill like just for instance your inspirations are charlie watts ringo star and acdc <laughs> you have a really laid back weird fill based drumming style where your hi-hats break weirdly yeah. but you're still doing the wish watch windscreen wiper yeah, you're doing thing the- <laughs> so you're doing and then playing a really weird fill in but that's your style and that's not necessarily something that you'd be taught but if you were taught in person they'd be like right one two don't break eights you don't do this you do this this way your fills you need to learn to play it to a click so you might lose that little nuance to yourself so that would always be my take of it yeah you might look at something that's taught really terribly but also it might help you find what makes you unique i suppose that was my takeaway from that no very 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 true where uh (sighs) like YouTube can be a scary place where you, you, you need to filter out and, and be your best judge of what's, what's right. Uh, which we've all practiced some things where you got, you know, you find out later, like, Oh, I shouldn't have been doing that. But, uh, no, very good point. Um, of just, we, there's a wealth of information out there right now, but there's no filter. There's no barrier to anyone can post anything online, uh, for better or worse. I mean, it's it's awesome. I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be doing this on the podcast and on YouTube if there was like a barrier. I mean, you'd have to I'm sure we could figure it out, but um it's different than the old days of like, you know, TV channels and and things like that, but um this has been awesome. I think this is a great conversation. It was it was different than than I'm um, in a in a very good way of of breaking it down uh about talking about how you did this and stuff. I I had a lot of fun. Um so um, Cadden is going to stick around and do a Patreon bonus episode. We're going to talk about uh, his PhD and the topics that he thinks are really worth researching because, I mean, even that wording alone, which which you have provided to me of, of uh, a good topic, is worth researching because this takes a lot of time. This takes a lot of energy and you don't want to research something that is just, you know, you're doing it. You're putting a lot of time and energy of your life into this and you want to make sure it's something that means something to you and that you can take and go on into your life and use you know and it's not just that it's that if anyone can get anything out of this because at the end of the day probably 90 percent of what all of this research and the stuff i've written is for is so that someone else can read it and learn something from it because i want people to and really get interested in the history of the drum kit yeah absolutely so we'll talk about that um if people want to hear that they can go to the uh Go to drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon button. Click it and two bucks a month. And uh, and also be sure, I think I've mentioned it before, but these video, if you're listening to the podcast, you can also check these out on YouTube where there's a video interview. Not every single episode. Sometimes things go horribly wrong and the uh, video fails or something. It's just the way it goes. So, But most of them now are video interviews and you can see the new lighting I got because now my background is green. Uh, and uh I'll be messing with that more as time goes along. But um, so, Cad, why don't you tell people again your website, where they can find you, anything cool you have coming up before we wrap up, and uh, then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at CGI Drummer. Uh, if you go on Instagram, it's not CGI Drummer 12. That's my personal account. You should be able to find CGI Drummer. Uh, that wasn't good forethought when I did that. Uh, my website is cgidrummer.com. Um, yeah, I've got nothing instantly, amazingly coming up instantly soon. Um, as awkward as I said that, but, uh, <laughs> I am in a, I am in a country band, uh, that we're looking to start doing some gigs in the next couple of months, uh, if things all work out well. Uh, and I recently did some percussion for a, uh, for a band called Miss Kill that they're going to be releasing their EP soon. So. Um, if you do follow me on any social medias, I will point you towards that when it appears. Cool. Thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your knowledge. And again, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on this. It's like uh, a dream come true. It sounds a bit corny probably, but yeah, this is, <laughs> this is, this is really fun. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thanks, Cad. <laughs>